Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, this morning. I hope you're enjoying the conference so far. Um, this is session six, and uh, having been able to speak to many of you over the last day or so, uh, it's become clear to me what many of you are interested in. And one of those topics seems to be, how do I enter a market where the barriers to entry are extremely high? How do I go into a market where the regulations are so stiff and so stringent that there's no way I'm gonna make it into this business? And it's very relevant that we're gonna be focusing on one industry in particular on this theme, and that is the business of aviation. Because as you know, in many countries, um, there are legacy carriers that have been doing business and dominated in that industry for many, many years. But 10 years ago, things changed in Asia. 10 years ago, there were no low-cost carriers. But right now, about a half, or maybe a little bit more than 50% of all the travel that is done in Asia is on a budget carrier. And our next speaker, Tony Fernandez, the CEO, group CEO of Air Asia, really innovated and pioneered in this business, and he started out with nothing. He bought a struggling airline business, and he turned it around, and now he has the biggest fleet in Asia. So please welcome the group CEO of Air Asia, Tony Fernandez. Morning, everyone. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank my good friend Mikitani san for inviting me to this wonderful conference and meeting so many great people. Uh, it is the most organized conference I've ever been to, and uh, it's so great to meet so many great people. <coughs> Though I'm going to disrupt the conference today. Uh, coming in the backstage reminded me of my old business. I used to be in the music business, and I felt like a pop artist coming through uh, on the backstage. Before I started airlines, I used to work with many artists, uh, Makihara, uh, Akina Nakamuri, and X Japan. In fact, I named our airline AirAsia X after X Japan, because I used to have many fun nights in Roppongi uh, with them. So I'll go through my, my story and a little bit how we started this airline, and then open it up to questions. So that was me uh, 13 years ago when I bought AirAsia with my partner, Kamarudin. We bought it for 25 cents and took on 10 million of debt. Uh, I left the music business. I left Time Warner because I felt that uh, they weren't going to innovate quick enough and embrace the internet. And my prophecy came through. I had no idea how, anything about airlines. I had no idea about the business. But I just had an idea. And uh, I started AirAsia. I started AirAsia on September the 9th three days before 9-11. So welcome to the aviation business. And I've been through every calamity known to mankind, every problem known to mankind. And I'll tell you a, a, a few of them. But that's us on December the 8th, 2001, having finally bought the airline for 25 cents and 10 million of debt. We started with two planes and 200 staff and 200,000 passengers in our first year. That was the old AirAsia. Um, it had been operated for five years. It had lost about 180 million uh, ringgit in five years. It never ever looked like making money. And uh, we took over it and changed it to uh, red. I tried really hard for it not to be red because uh, everyone thinks I want to be Richard Branson. But I have zero intention of going to the moon I have much more fun in Tokyo with Mickey than uh, going to the moon or flying across on a balloon uh, in the middle of the ocean. But red is a powerful color. And the first thing we did actually was to drop the bird and uh, use our logo, AirAsia, as our brand. If you think of the biggest brands in the world, there is one image in your mind. If I say Coca-Cola, you think of the Coca-Cola in italic writing. If I see Nike, you think of the swoosh. You generally only have one image in your mind. So we dropped the uh, bird and we used AirAsia as our, as our brand. That's our growth um, over the last 12 years. 200,000 passengers in the first year. Uh, 2013, we did 43 million passengers. And uh, this year, we will do about 52 uh, million passengers. Uh, we've opened in five countries, uh, about to open in India. And I hope 
we will have another chance of re-entering the Japanese market in uh, 2015. We've won the world's best low-cost carrier five years in a row, which is something that is, has been very proud for us over that time. If you look at the passenger growth, we've had so many problems. SARS, bird flu, tsunami, earthquakes, you name it. National carriers, governments blocking us. But we've always found a way. And I think to all the entrepreneurs out there, I think my first message is there will always be obstacles. But through any problem, there's always a silver lining. And there's always an opportunity to uh, build your business. I'll give you one example. During SARS, I don't know if you remember SARS, but no one wanted to fly. They all thought they were going to die if they went on an airplane. So all the airlines cut their flights, reduced their capacity. So I went to my, my marketing team and said, look, this is a great time. Triple our marketing spend now. And they all looked at me like, what drugs are you taking? And I said, no, this is the best time to build our brand because no one else is advertising. Plus, I knew Malaysians very well. If we put a fare low enough, they will risk their lives. <laughs> okay, 800 ringgit to Kota Kinabalu, no, I'm not going to fly. 80 ringgit, who cares, I'm going. And so we managed to build our brand, we managed to make some money through SARS, and we were able to survive. So I think the first message is, there will always be problems as an entrepreneur. There will always be issues, but you can always change the market, disrupt the market, try new things, and as a new entrepreneur, you should be able to react much quicker than companies that have long established uh, infrastructures. The key to our business is low cost. We're the lowest cost airline in the world by a long way. Low cost equals low fares, which enables us to um, stimulate the market. What we've done is really, as this whole conference is about disruption, is we've disrupted the aviation market. Before AirAsia, there was no low-cost carrier. By bringing in low fares, we brought a whole new market that just wasn't there before. So it's, if you imagine in Tokyo, if every hotel is a five-star hotel, the market is very small. If every car is a Lexus car, there would be very few people who would have a car. But by having different price categories, you, you enable the market to grow, and that's what we did um, in these 12 years. In 12 years, 220 million people have flown on AirAsia. And we estimate almost 60% of that market are people who never flew before. And as you'll see later on in the presentation. So how did we do it? How did we go from a loss-making uh, airline, which we bought for 25 cents, and now we're worth something like three and a half billion in 12 years? I think the first thing I want to talk about, I know everything here is focused on technology. I just want to spend a little bit of time on people. Uh, we really focused a lot on our people. We saw the biggest asset in your company is actually the people in your company. And we found airlines to be very stodgy, very hierarchical, and um, really didn't communicate very well. So we started to break the mold. I don't have an office. I operate from a desk. We're all in one office. We all go through one door. If you look at other airlines, pilots are one gang, engineers are another gang, etc. We disrupted the way airlines think by bringing everyone together. Pilots and engineers generally don't like each other. And that cost the company a lot of money. So I made our chief pilot and our chief engineer take a picture of each other in their wallet and put them next to each other and force them to eat next to each other. And believe me, we saved millions of dollars through that one photograph. So we, we broke conventional thinking. We all have an open plan office. We all have a desk. We dress down. I, I dressed up today for Mickey. And um, if you look worse than your staff, then they feel comfortable in talking to you. You know, if you put a suit and a tie, you put a little bit of a distance between yourself and your staff. But when you look worse than them, then they feel very comfortable to talk to you. And I'd rather have 15,000 brains working for me than just 10. Uh, it gives me a problem in Malaysian airports because they think I'm an illegal immigrant uh, because of the way I look, but that's the pain. And we thought, how are we going to grow from two planes to 150 planes, which is what we have now, without people? So we looked unconventionally to find talent. 
and I think this is the biggest, biggest success factor of AirAsia. Uh, the cost is one, but having a fighting workforce and developing talent has been our strength. Um, and I'll tell you a couple of stories of how we've done that. So, you know, I used to, I don't do it very often now, I used to carry bags uh, every month. I used to be a cabin crew every two months and I check in every three months. I did it for two reasons. One, I don't think you can be an effective CEO unless you're prepared to go down to the ground and do your job uh, and learn the job. Second is I wanted to meet my, my staff. I wanted to meet talented people. I wanted to break the conventional mode that they didn't have to get an MBA, they didn't have to go to Oxford University, that there was talent within my company and cream always rises to the top. So I, I'll give you two stories. You know, when we went from 737 to the Airbus, you know, we used to just throw the bags into the plane. Uh, not throw the bags in, lovingly put the bags. Nice bag. And with the Airbus, it was slightly higher, so we had to um, use belt loaders. Those belt loaders cost a lot of money, so my team said, we need to buy belt loaders. And I said, no, no way, that costs way too much money. Uh, we carry on doing what we're doing. So. The next time I was carrying bags, they put me on Indonesian flights. Now, people who fly with us generally bring their house with them. People who uh, fly to Indonesia bring their neighbor's house as well. So there was a lot of bags, and I almost broke my back in the process. And I said, okay, I'm wrong, you're right, we go buy belt loaders. If I didn't do that, I'm sure I would have created a union and I would have destroyed many people's backs. So I think it's important as a leader to get down to the ground and uh, understand your job. Second was, I wanted to find talent. I was lucky, I had a good education, but I saw there were many talented kids in my company who just didn't have money for higher education. So I opened up pilot training to anybody. I said, it didn't matter whether you went to school, when you left school, etc. If you want to be a pilot, we will support you. And of our first 18 cadets, 11 came from within the company. Uh, cabin crew, uh, check-in staff, etc. And one boy from East Malaysia uh, carried bags. He left school at 12, but I knew he was really a smart boy. And we, we put him through pilot school. He got the highest marks ever in Malaysian Flying Academy. And today he's a captain on a brand new A320. So in seven years, he went from carrying bags for us, uh, earning probably one of the lowest salaries in our company, to one of the top salaries as a captain of an A320. And that's how we've developed talent in the company. We've broken conventional modes, we've looked at new places to find talent, and that's how we've grown from two planes to 150 planes. Uh, this girl, she came up to me in a bar in Roppongi and said, look, I really want to be a pilot. And I said, great, go for it. And she took her pilot's exams and she passed and she was doing really well. Then she turned up one day, she called me up and said, everyone says I'm really beautiful. Can I take part in Miss Thailand? I said, okay, provided if you win, I get to use your photograph for the rest of your life for free. She won Miss Thailand and came fifth in Miss Universe. And now she's back training to be a captain in uh, AirAsia Thailand. So we're the only airline in the world with a Miss Thailand flying for them. Uh, beat that Singapore Airlines. <laughs> but the moral of the story is because our culture is so flat, she had the ability to come and talk to me. And women pilots, there were no female pilots in AirAsia. And I said to my chief pilot, why are there no female pilots? And he came up with the most ridiculous answer I could ever say, which I can't repeat in public. And so I said, if a woman can run a country, she can certainly fly a plane. And today we have 42 female pilots. And the other day was history. Captain was female, co-pilot was female, all the cabin crew were female, and all the passengers were male. Uh, my last bit's not true. But again, if we didn't break the conventional wisdom, we would have wasted a whole bunch of society that has helped us grow to 150 planes. So people is your biggest asset. In the new economy, breaking the way people think to innovate starts with innovation within your own company to think differently. There's our, our two female pilots. That's the first female captain. 
And our guys. The next thing is branding. I think too many great companies don't spend enough time on branding. And we have spent a fortune in branding, sponsoring football teams, Formula One, um, lots of music events, etc. Too many great ideas. And in the new economy, as there's so many, I've met so many talented people in this conference, the great thing is to make sure those ideas are known. So make sure you put some budget towards marketing and branding because there's a lot of noise out there to get heard is difficult so as we went from seven planes to you know 150 we were able to do that yes because we had low fares but two people knew about us uh, you know we sponsored Manchester United when we had very little money very painful experience for me because I hate Manchester United but you have to be a prostitute once in a while and that's how we've been able to, to build our brand. You know, we sponsored the referees in the Premier League. Uh, we, we pushed all levels of boundaries to get to where we are. And we do crazy things. This is my good friend, Mr. Branson, who lost a bet to me. And uh, I made him dress up as a stewardess on AirAsia. And he was an excellent stewardess. I think if he ever fails in his business, I will offer him a job. But that one bet earned us so much coverage, so much coverage. And so again, we've done things differently in trying to build our brand and taking it forward. And again, I urge all the new entrepreneurs, disruption is, yes, about the business model, but it's also about how you market, it's about how you think about people, and how do you motivate your people, how are you different from your competition, to extract value and be different. I won't go through this so much because I think this whole room's bloody expert on it. But we, at a very early stage, saw technology as a great uh, advantage we would have across the full service airlines such as Malaysia and Singapore Airlines, etc. We adopted technology very early. 85% of our business is done on the internet. We embrace Facebook and mobile, etc. very, very early. And again, I think the new economy which listening to Prime Minister Abe yesterday and what Mickey's been talking about all the time in trying to reinvigorate Japan uh, is about entrepreneurs, is about new technology and I think that's the great leveler. Even though we may not have enough capital, technology has been a big plus. I started AirAsia with half a million dollars. That's all the money I had uh, to start this airline. And technology and people and marketing contributed to our success. And again, if you look at disruption in, in markets, 50% of our routes are routes that were never done before. Again, conventional airlines just went everywhere. We looked for new markets. We looked for new uh, places. Never been a flight from Kuala Lumpur to Nagoya. We started that two weeks ago. It's full every day. It costs about $150 to fly from Nagoya to Kuala Lumpur and then connect our network. So again, a lot of our routes are routes that were never, never done before. We went to Macau before they built all those casinos because we couldn't afford Hong Kong. People laughed at us and now we have 32 flights a day to Macau. Um, I remember doing cheeky advertising. I said, at least you have a low fare to take you home when you lose all your money. So there's always ways of developing market and finding new markets and that's what we've been fairly good at. So in, in summary, you know, the future of business is about breaking cartels. My whole life has been about breaking cartels. It's painful, it's tiring. Governments generally don't like you when you try and do that. But we've got to do that for this new economy to take place. We've got to disrupt politics. Disruption will be the norm going forward. And uh, we're living examples of probably the most highly regulated business uh, being able to disrupt uh, the business. It's not easy going against establishment. It's not easy trying to change rules that have been there for a long, long time. But it can be done. It, it's tiring. But when you see the satisfaction of people who never thought they could fly before, fly, then it's great. One last bit, which I didn't talk about, is part of our model is also using technology to create new ancillary income streams, from shopping to um, hotels, etc. So again, the new economy has enabled us to disrupt the market further and lower fares. And I hope to be back in Japan with AirAsia Japan in the not distant future, 
eating a lot of vanilla and having a lot of peaches uh, in 2015. So my motto for this year is change the sky, change Japan. Let's make sure everyone can really fly. My tagline is now everyone can fly. I hope AirAsia Japan can change many people's lives and also bring many people to this amazing country. Whatever anyone says, Japan is still the center of Asian culture and everyone wants to come to Japan. But right now, it's too expensive. We'll change that and make it cheaper and we'll allow you to fly more. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Miki, for inviting me to this conference. Thanks so much, Tony. <laughs> okay. Tony, I remember that lost bet with uh, Richard Branson. And I remember that got a lot of coverage on CNBC. We played it many, many times, so I can vouch for that. Uh, I'd like to open up the floor uh, to any questions you may have for Tony Fernandez. Um, I'm sure you have many, particularly his last comments uh, regarding possible re-entry into the Japanese market. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand and uh, we'll be happy to bring a mic to you. Please. Please. Uh, gentlemen in the front row, please. I would like to ask my question in English. Ah, sorry. Thank you. Um, uh, anyway, in, in, uh, in okay. uh, cool, uh, So, you're a true revolutionary in the um, aviation industry. I'm so proud to have you with us today, and I'm so proud to be able to ask you a question like this. Now, I graduated from the university in the Philippines and uh, Holland, and then I lived in China and Canada. I have uh, maybe lived in 30 different places so far. And I want to communicate to uh, the people outside the world, outside Japan, uh, how wonderful Japan is. So Cool Japan a channel should be revolutionized. And uh, we want to uh, gather 3 million um, non-Japanese people to get behind this uh, project to revolutionize um, tourist industry in Japan. Now, I want to convert um, headaches or problems into uh, solutions. For example, in China, we have this problem. Um, Sinaweibo, uh, information about Japan is not really transmitted very well, but uh, with using Sinaweibo, 1.2 million followers uh, we have now, and uh, by the end of the year we will have 5 million. And in Taiwan, um, Taiwanese uh, tourists have this problem with a poor Wi-Fi connection in Japan, when they come to Japan. So we want to uh, collaborate with um, the operators for to install more Wi-Fi routers. And uh, Malaysian people, when they come to Japan, what kind of problems do they have as uh, tourists? I would like to ask um, about your idea. And also, how can we disrupt the um, Japanese tourist industry? What are some of the ideas or suggestions you might have to disrupt the tourist industry in Japan? Thank you for the question. Um, I think, obviously, one of the, one of the great disruptors is to have low fares and to allow more people to fly and to allow more people to travel new destinations. Within then, everything is concentrated on a few airports in Japan. I think that's fan Japan is not just Tokyo and Osaka. There's a, there's a huge opportunity outside of these markets and a lot of the world doesn't know about them. From Sendai to Kobe um, to Nagoya, um, there is a lot to see. So I think low fares gives people the opportunity to come. And then actually it's word of mouth. The power of other people telling their friends, wow, Nagoya is amazing. Wow, Sendai has so much to see. So I think what we're trying to work at is, is to try and get airports to support us developing new routes and new traffic flows. And uh, that, I think, will disrupt a lot of the market. I think um, a lot of the infrastructure is already in place in terms of ground infrastructure. There's good buses to move people around. There's obviously excellent trains. There's different types of hotels. There's an amazing amount of food and, and shopping and, of course, culture to see. So I don't think Malaysians struggle. Um, our big campaign, actually, was to remove visas for people in Southeast Asia. I, I must have seen the Japanese ambassador 100 million times um, to say, you know, and I think our, our, our fantastic ambassador is here 
who, who did an amazing job. So I think removing travel restrictions, there will obviously be a few people that will abuse it, but don't cut the masses for a few. So I think Malaysians have no problem in Japan. We've had a long relationship. And in terms of uh, disrupting the market, opening up new markets, I think would be great. Tony, just to follow up on that, I mean, we were talking offline in the back that the infrastructure is so great here, everything runs on time, but that comes with a cost, usually. Um, how do you overcome that premium um, in a market like this where you're, you need to keep your costs lean? Well, I, I wasn't going to tell the entire conference all our secrets. Um, otherwise, I'm sure it'll go somewhere else. <laughs> but uh, it's efficiency, it's using technology, it's breaking the normal way of doing things. Um, just the way our people think now uh, has already saved a, a tremendous amount of money. So can be done. Japan is no different from any other country in the world. Uh, AirAsia X, every flight from Haneda, Nagoya, Osaka is full. I, I couldn't get a seat um, on my own airline uh, coming up here. So I won't tell you how I came because it's a very, very unlow cost way. But. Um, <laughs> You know, people are, uh, like like um, our product, and Japan is no different. Okay. Anyone else uh, like to ask Tony a question? I think we have a gentleman in the back, please. Uh, hello, uh, hello, Tony. Very interesting presentation. Um, I'm a, uh, a professor down in Hong Kong. Also run a digital agency, and one of our clients actually is Cathay Pacific. So I uh, have some experience of working in the airline industry. As you say, it is quite a challenging industry, so certainly for the established carriers. My question for you is more your background. You were working at Warner before in Malaysia in the entertainment industry. And I think um, I'd be very interested to know how you took your understanding of media and entertainment and used it in AirAsia. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's, no one can really understand how I went from selling Akina Nakamuri in ex-Japan to selling airline seats. But uh, there's a lot of similarity, actually. First of all, business is business. It's about maximizing your top line, minimizing your cost, and having a good balance sheet. I'm an old-fashioned guy that believes in cash. So whether you're in the music business, whether you're a new technology company, whether you're an airline, those principles apply. Uh, the experience I took from the music business is marketing. Uh, if you think there are thousands of artists every day, thousands of songs you have to promote, um, limited radio stations, and in my day, um, this is before TuneIn and internet radio and all these other things. So we had to work really hard to get an artist and a song to be heard. So when I came into the airline business, it was much easier. You know, they all talked about flying on a feather, Singapore girl, you know, I don't know what the Japanese airlines were talking about, but it was much easier to market. So I, I brought a lot of marketing experience and people. We had very flat structures. I keep going back to people because no matter what technology, no matter what idea you have, the most important thing is surrounding yourself with good people and implementation. Um, and the record industry taught me that hierarchy is bad. And you know, I'm sure hierarchy destroys lots and lots of businesses. A lot of Asian companies, decision making is made at the top and everyone else is an implementer. At AirAsia, I have you know, 10, 12,000, 15,000 brains working for me. Everyone has my mobile phone number. Everyone can call me and give me an idea. And some of my greatest ideas have come from outside of their, outside of their business, creating uh, disruption and creating innovation is about creating an environment for disruption and an environment for innovation. If everyone's scared to come up with ideas, you'll never be able to innovate. If everyone's scared of failure, you'll never take that, that idea. I always tell my staff, dream big, because from some dreams come some reality. You know, it's, it's a crazy idea for someone who is selling records to start an airline. But I didn't care. I was fairly young at the time. I thought if I fail, I fail. I didn't want to sit there at 55 and say, I wish I did that, because it's too late. You can't 
press a rewind button on your life. So long answer to a short question, but basically uh, branding, marketing, and a flat structure. You know, we didn't have too much hierarchy in the music business. Speaking of people, Tony, um, when you came into the Japan, you had a partner and you dissolved that partnership. And now you talk about coming back in 2015. You're looking for a partner. Um, there aren't that many partners left anymore in this industry, in your particular industry. Does that mean you're going to look outside of the aviation? And what are you going to look for in a new partner when you try to come back into this market? Someone who likes me. Um, <laughs> no, I think partnership is sacred. And, um, you know, all our partners in other countries have been non-airlines. This was the first partnership where we had with an airline. And I think the problem was there were two captains. Um, you know, can you imagine Japan with two prime ministers? Well, maybe you can. But um, it was too hard to make decisions because everyone had their own idea. So I think our mistake was there's got to be one captain in the ship. We look for people who are like-minded like us, who want to disrupt, who want to change, who have the ability to influence uh, policies uh, within the local environment, and have some fun. Because I know it looks a scary business, but it's an amazing business because you can really change people's lives. And in our case, you know, when, when you look at our cabin crew in Japan before, and the pilots, Everyone had a lot of fun. And I think AirAsia can make a difference to Japanese working culture. And definitely we can make a difference to tourism and people's lives by making fly. So we want to have like-minded people who share our vision and share our ambition. But for example, in India, you have a partner um, you like, but uh, you're not getting the license. Everyone is blocking you at every turn into the, when you're in your in entry to the Indian market. I mean, people yeah. are suing you left, right, and center. How do you overcome that? Just you've got to be thick-skinned. You know, it's the only country in the world that is useful to be Indian, which I am. So you just got to keep, keep plugging away. Look, it took me seven years to get Kuala Lumpur, Singapore as a flight. I was blocked by Malaysia, then I was blocked by Singapore, then I was probably blocked by both. But we kept fighting, we kept fighting, we kept fighting. I remember the reporter said to me, don't you get tired of fighting this? I get tired of reporting this. <laughs> and I said, well, it's my life. I owe it to my shareholders, I owe it to my staff. And now we're the biggest airline in Singapore after four years. So you have to have a lot of energy, you have to have a lot of patience, and you know, working with artists such as Makihara and Akina Nakamuri, they train you to have a lot of patience. Big egos. Uh, <laughs> big egos. <laughs> Anyone else out there? Please. <laughs> uh, th thank you, Tony, for your excellent presentation. I appreciate uh, if you could make some comments about the re recent sad incident by Malaysian Airlines. And also, uh, uh, maybe may, may know whether you have taken another additional action in your own company. Wow, that's a tough question. <laughs> Is there a Fifth Amendment in Japan? Um, I think, honestly, I obviously have lots of thoughts on that, but I think it's not right for me to say anything right now until the aircraft is found and we know what happened. Um, but, you know, from any tra disaster, tragedy, we learn and we implement. Again, I don't want to look like I'm cleverer and we've done things, etc. but obviously we are, we are learning and I think all airlines are learning from this experience. Um, and, uh, you know, but let's find out exactly what happened. Uh, because you can't really implement until you know really what happened, but there's certain things that we're looking at. Um, and God willing, they will find this aircraft uh, soon. This is, a, of course, a deep tragedy uh, for all those involved, but uh, um, when you say you're looking into new avenues, a lot of focus has been on the satellite tracking. Um, are you considering uh, adding that additional layer or looking into something like that for the future? Well, before this tragedy, actually, we, we were putting on internet onto the aircraft, which is a, a big driver of our ancillary incomes. We want to not treat ourselves as an airline. We think, actually, 
we're no different from a Lawson or a 7-Eleven uh, or a big supermarket. People come to our plane, there's many opportunity to sell many other things to them that maybe airports are selling, etc. So uh, we think what Rakuten has done is, is amazing. And uh, mobile money and all these things are things that we can bring into our airline space. Uh, what airlines don't realize is there's a massive CRM there and there's a massive opportunity to monetize the customers that are there. So we were putting on the internet, which would have a separate satellite system to the ones that the cockpit had um, by, by, um, you know, by, by the way it's looking, I think people will head towards that direction anyway. Definitely satellite tracking is, is important. But you know, I think an idea, and I don't know whether it can be done, but the black box information, it'd be great if that could be sent into the cloud and be real time. You know, I think there's no reason why that information can't be transferred directly to, to a server so we, we know almost immediately what happened and where that aircraft is. It's an idea for all the tech people here. Absolutely. Uh, we're running out of time, but we have time for one last question. If there's anyone out there who'd like to ask one final question. Man at the back. I'm in the back with a hand I see up uh, in the middle row in the back. Hello, uh, my name is Haltor. I work for an embassy here in Tokyo. Uh, thank you, Tony, for a great talk. Uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit about sort of the regula regulatory environment that you face here in Japan versus how, uh, how your work with the regulatory environments in, in Asia have gone. Now, Tokyo is working really hard to be the hub for Japan, as many other countries. And with Haneda coming and fighting with Narita for, uh, for uh, the connection to the city, how do you see this uh, sort of advancing and, and, and what do you see the benefits of this competition of airports in the city? Yeah. Thank you. That's a great question to end. I mean, can I, can I say that, um, and I'm not saying this because I'm in Japan, etc. but I've seen such a dramatic change. Uh, no country is making so much advancement uh, in North Asia as Japan. I don't think I'd ever, ever dream of getting a license in Korea for instance. Uh, Korea exports so much stuff all around, but actually they protect their own market. But here, I think Japan's being very open and being uh, not so inclusive. So I'm very encouraged. JCAB have been great. I think there's a Chinese airline that's opening here. So I think there's going to be a lot of competition and a lot of the consumers will benefit dramatically and the market will be definitely disrupted. So I see, and listening to Prime Minister Abe and all that he's saying and what Mickey's been telling me, it's a great time uh, for us to be in Japan. So I think the regulations are moving very, very positively. On airport side, I think Tokyo has a problem. Um, I think there needs to be a third airport. Uh, and I would strongly encourage the government to look at maybe creating a low cost airport uh, somewhere because Narita is anything but low cost. Uh, Haneda is also expensive and it's, it's, you know, it's full. And I think more full service carriers will be going there. So I think there's an opportunity to create a low-cost airport. But again, I see lots of great airports around Japan that are underutilized, Nagoya, Sendai, uh, lots around, so we can get there. So we're very excited to be here. Again, thank you very much. I, I, it's a huge audience. Uh, congratulations, Mickey, on uh, all you're doing and breaking, disrupting, causing problems. It's nice to see someone else doing it, apart from me, <laughs> in my own country. <laughs> and. Uh, as I tell everyone, believe the unbelievable. Never take no for an answer and dream. Because you know, from some dreams come some reality. So for all the budding entrepreneurs there, don't let anyone tell you you can't do it. You're looking at someone who used to sell records and is now causing havoc in the uh, airline industry. We did budget hotels, we're doing internet stuff. I'm gonna do a budget hospital. What does that mean? Um, does that mean that I'll charge you for oxygen or uh, I'll give you half a Panadol? Same like the airlines, I think hospitals are so inefficient and the state can never look after everybody um, and private hospital is too expensive. So there's a gap in the middle and I take all the efficiencies I've learned from the airline business and bring it into the hospital area and help a lot more people. So halfway through your operation, we'll say you run out of money, where's your eddy card? to uh, top it up. No, no, I'm only joking, you look very serious audience. <laughs> but there is a huge opportunity in there. So 
Go out there, live your dreams. Don't let anyone tell you that you can't do it. You only live once. Make the most out of your life. Be positive. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tony Fernandez, the CEO of Group Asia.